Welcome to this next session on negotiating with non-state actors. I'm delighted to be chairing this panel and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments in due course. I'd also like to give a special welcome to our online audience and I look for forward to hearing your comments and questions via Facebook and Twitter. The format of the session will be that in a moment I'm going to introduce our panellists here and ask them to spend a few minutes sharing their views on this issue of negotiating with non-state actors. Then I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. So please be thinking about what you want to ask the panellists because I intend to make this as interactive as possible. The purpose of the session is to think a bit more about the increasing role non-state actors play in the humanitarian situation and how their increased presence can complicate and at times hinder the effective delivery of humanitarian aid. The prevalence of non-state actors in current conflicts challenges the humanitarian system which was established very much on a state-based approach to aid delivery. The impact on civilians living in these areas is unne unnecessarily unjust, prejudicing an already vulnerable group based on factors largely beyond their control. Negotiating with non-state actors, however, brings up a number of issues for humanitarian actors, and much of what humanita humanitarians need to do is achieve a balance between humanitarian principles, the interests of non-state actors and states, and of course the overarching objective of humanitarian work, which is to, to reach the people in need. It's not a straightforward equation, and there are operational constraints, legal constraints, and at times moral constraints that all need to be taken into consideration when operating in these complex environments. I work at Chatham House, and at Chatham House we've been looking at this issue for the last couple of years uh, from the point of view of the states, and what they can do to help facilitate humanitarian access to areas controlled by non-state armed groups. For the last year, we've been taking a particular focus on the legal framework uh, within which humanitarians and others have to operate, and in particular, the impact sanctions and counter-terrorism legislation has on the delivery, which I'm sure we'll cover. It's a fascinating subject, it's a difficult subject, but it's a very important subject. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce our three panelists who are going to present to you in a moment. To my right is Mamadou Sow. Mamadou has been with ICRC since 2007, serving as a delegate in Rwanda, Iraq, Nigeria, Afghanistan, North Mali, and Palestine. He is currently based at the ICRC's headquarters in Geneva as an operations coordinator for Africa, covering mainly the Lake Chad Basin context. Next to him is Michiel Hoffman. Michiel worked for MSF in field missions between 93 and 98, all over the place, in DRC, Bosnia, Burundi, Sri Lanka, Brazil, South Sudan, and Kosovo. He is currently working as a senior humanitarian specialist for MSF based out of Belfast, concentrating on research, training, and operational support, as well as producing publications uh, in the humanitarian field. And our third speaker is Zedun Al-Zorbi. Uh, Zedun is a pacifist activist from Syria. He is the CEO of the Union of Medical Care and Relief Organizations with more than 1,100 workers. They work to build and run hospitals in Syria uh, and he engages with civil society in a variety of ways and in a variety of contexts. So I'm gonna hand over to Mamadou first to uh, share your thoughts on this topic. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm from Africa, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting to be in Berlin for a Congress. <laughs> I, I, I hope you get the, the joke. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, I'm currently um, in Geneva now, after, after 10 years working in the field, uh, in the last six, six months, I'm now based in Geneva, uh, coordinating our operations in, for the Lake Chad. Um, and I will, 
if you allow me in the next few minutes, uh, try to get into this, this, this very timely topic of the dilemma that, uh, that are faced uh, by humanitarian actors in the field uh, when it comes to negotiating with non-state armed groups. Uh, first, allow me to, to set a little bit the stage uh, because uh, we are talking about this engagement with non-state armed groups, um, especially and particularly in contexts that are, that are linked to the so-called uh, global war and terror, or what we call the, the, the confrontation uh, between jihadis and their adversaries. There are two things that this uh, post-9-11 world has brought. Uh, one is uh, some challenges, some, some, some often fundamental challenges to international humanitarian law, which is our, our guiding uh, framework. Uh, and one of the challenges is that we knew before two actors in conflict, the, the fighters and the civilians. Now you have these new categories of, of enemy combatants. Huh? Uh, unworthy of, of, of even being treated, uh, sometimes talked to, or much less negotiating with. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and the flip side of this, is you have the jihadis, uh, those so-called terrorists. Um, they also, uh, to a large extent, went out their way to, to dub um, haram, pretty much everything Westerner, uh, and this includes, of course, uh, aid agencies. Um, and for what we represent, uh, but not so much what we do. Uh. So we are now a bit stuck between a rock and a hard place, having to to maneuver in this very very narrow space that has really shrunk the the, the humanitarian space. Um, and the question before us today is, uh, within this space, how do you maneuver? Do you give up something on your principles? Uh, do you give up something on your ethics? Uh, what do you let go if you do? Uh, uh, in order to be able to, to continue to work and to deliver the, the needed aid and assistance to people who are, who are needed. I will argue, uh, uh, because I speak on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross, that it is precisely because we are challenged. It is precisely because that this space has shrunk. It is precisely because the core sometime of IHL is is, is, uh, is challenged that we take it um, upon ourselves to be more rigorous in the principles. Uh, so my argument is that we don't compromise on the principles, but instead what we do, uh, and this is, this is where we will get to, to, to maybe some examples from the field, is to be proactive to be innovative and to be pragmatic in finding ways to maneuver between these, these, these complicated uh, protagonists in the field. Knowing that the big challenge that this face, this, 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 uh, this posed to us is the security challenge. Uh, and the security challenge is a serious challenge, for, especially for those of us who've been uh, carrying out or, or, or leading operations in the field and, and sending so many of our colleagues out to, to deliver assistance uh, to people in need. It's, and we did, uh, we did pay a, a heavy price, uh, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> and every price is a price too much. Every life is a, is a life too much. Um, you know, a few centuries ago, there is this, this poet, John Donne, who said, uh, the death of every man diminishes me because I am involved with mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the death toll, the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. 
So every time we lose a colleague, we lose something. You know, something in us uh, go with it. So considering the, the, the volatile nature of the context, of the environment, the, the security challenges, the different challenges on all sides, I'm going to show you how sometimes in really complicated places like Afghanistan or, or Nigeria or, or Iraq, we have to be firm with our principle uh, in order to be able to continue to, to deliver the assistance that is needed. The catch-22 in, in, in complicated area is this. Um, security guarantees that we often seek uh, from fighters on the ground uh, and promises that we receive some time, we know that this is not enough uh, some to, to, for us to be able to maneuver in these spaces uh, because we can get into this later on, the complication of non-state armed groups. Sometimes the chain of command is not very clear. Sometimes you have new groups, sometimes you have foreign fighters, and all these things uh, add some complication in in, in the security analysis. You need action to be able to be accepted. It's not words. But to be able to work uh, and have that impact, you need the guarantees to work. You know? so, so that's a catch-22 catch, uh, situation. And, and, and in this space, you have, to, you have to manual. What we do in the ICRC in places that are so complicated is that we start with activities that are very uh, true to our mandate you know? uh, in places that are safer uh, and, and, and build from that. For example, uh, a good example would be in Afghanistan when it was just really difficult to, to, to work with the, with the heavy toe that I've mentioned in our, uh, in our radar mirror. Uh, what we did, knowing the imperative necessity to work on all sides and engage with, with all parties, we, 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 we created this system of taxis to be able to evacuate wounded fighters from the other side, wounded Taliban from the other side. Uh, so the taxi drivers will have an ID card, the ICRC stamp, that says that this man is working on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross while transporting an injured person. Now we, we told the American soldiers uh, and the military in general that this is the system that we have in place and they should allow the continuum of care. Um, so so, so this, this program went on. And so we have these taxis coming out of, of, of Helmand province, of these really complicated Taliban strongholds, into Kandahar, where I was working. And we will check to make sure that it's a war wound, and then uh, reimburse the taxi driver, to, uh, and the patient will be treated. Um, so this exposed us less. We continued to do the humanitarian assistance, um, but it's pragmatic response. It's not ideal. Ideally, you would have gone with your ambulance and, and, and do like, uh, like what Henri Dinon had in mind uh, a few centuries ago. But, but this is a pragmatic response. Another, another way we work around this is through uh, our detention work. Now, you know, when we, when we visit people who are who were, who were arrested in the context of armed conflict. We, we engage with them on their conditions of arrest, on their condition of detention, their treatment, and we have this, this, this bilateral and confidential discussion with those holding them. And sometime in the course of these visits, it became quite obvious uh, the life-saving nature of this work. Because again, we're in the global war on terror, and many of these authorities, they'd rather not spend money feeding detainees. So the fact that we are there, um, give us access to these non-state armed groups who are now hors combat, and we are supporting and assisting uh, them within the framework of our mandate. And this has a reverberating effect outside. And you can also build on that to get out, but to stay true to, to, to yourself instead of buying access um, along the way. Uh, and in this course, I can tell you, we have met 
in places of detention, folks who've ordered the killing of our colleagues or the explosion of our offices, um, but again, need-based, uh, and they were just as assisted as the others. And many of them end up becoming an uh, interesting interlocutor for us uh, that helped us also be able to, 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 to get out uh, there. Sometime, uh, for example, in Sudan or in Rwanda, you can make your assessment. You have two communities with tensions. You know that here, the needs of food. Here, it might not be food. Huh? Uh, but to get there, you have to cross here with your, your trucks. But here they need vaccination of cattle more so than food. So an, Im an impartial aid delivery would, would mean you would be, you'll have to be stubborn on this, you know, because it's need-driven, uh, not politics. But to be pragmatic, sometime, uh, uh, you will have to consider maybe uh, extending more assistance to this community because you know that otherwise they will be looted. Um, so, so my point is we have to be firm on principles but, but, but uh, soft and, and sometimes uh, pragmatic when it comes to, to dealing with, uh, with, with people. Uh, something that has been said uh, in the past was that the fact that we engage non-state armed groups might bestow upon them a legitimate status, you know, that the ICRC is legitimizing um, uh, these, these terrorists by, by, by engaging them. But, uh, but, but this discussion now has more or less been tabled, uh, at least in, in, in many parts of the world. Uh, we do not distribute uh, legitimacy. The Geneva Convention doesn't. Uh, uh, but, again, to be firm on principles, what we do with the non-state armed groups is that we tell them engaging with us has a price. You know? And the price is, one, we cannot be a rubber stamp, you know, uh, that you can brag about being uh, involved with the ICRC, allowing ICRC to visit your detainees, etc., um, and take political credit from that and not show results. So what we do is we evaluate concrete results on the field um, because the promotion of IHL continue and will always be uh, a cornerstone of what we do. Uh, I'm, uh, I can recall, for example, in, in Afghanistan, there was, uh, there, was a, there was a very spectacular attack that took place. Uh, the Taliban had used uh, an ambulance to, to detonate to, as a suicide attack. And, 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 and there was, of course, I mean, heated debate on this because we, you know, unlike many other organizations, uh, we're not keyboard activists. Huh? Uh, every day we cross the lines we shake the hands of, of those perpetrating some of these attacks, and we negotiate access on behalf of those affected by conflict. Uh, so what we say in public uh, has resonance in, in, in the realities of, 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 of our colleagues and victims on the ground. But, but this time, we decided to go out political. Yeah? We, and something we don't do quite often, we went public and condemned a very firmly this attack. You know, I can tell you that uh, that week uh, in Kandahar we didn't sleep because we, we saw it coming. But it was a calculated decision that, uh, that, that a line has been crossed and, and we had to, 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 to make that point. What happened in the following weeks was that the Taliban issued a new order to all their fighters never to use ambulances. Um, and in the subsequent orders that they issued, we always saw this, this um, uh, IHL-friendly uh, languages to a certain extent. And up to now, we have not seen the use of this. Uh, we come through different angles also by bringing in a dialogue on Islam and IHL with these groups. Because instead of coming without Geneva Conventions, we stay on course, 
but we engage with the religious leaders on, on, the, on the, the, the convergences between Islamic Sharia and international humanitarian law, and, and we meet somewhere, and this is a, an interesting entry point into, into the dialogue. So to conclude, we don't compromise on, on, on principles when we engage with non-state armed group, we, but we re remain realistic, willing and able to adjust our modus operandi, our scope of operation, we have to reduce if necessary. Um, but we build from, from, from these principles, uh, no matter what. And I look forward to, to the engagement with you later on. Thank you. Right, yeah, that's working. Um, engagement with non-state uh, armed groups. Uh, when I was asked to do this, uh, I recalled uh, an episode in uh, 2009 uh, when I was involved in uh, negotiating uh, the humanitarian space, if you like, in uh, Afghanistan for MSF uh, that I had with uh, the leadership of the, the Taliban, the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan, as they call themselves, in. Uh, an undisclosed location in, uh, in, in Pakistan. At the end of the meeting, when we reached an agreement on IHL, treatment of wounded and all of that, uh, uh, the representative of the Taliban uh, said, well, it, it was always obvious that we would reach an agreement because after all, uh, we are both an NGO. We are both a non-governmental organization. That <laughs> made me think for a bit. Uh, actually, two things. It happened after that. Uh, from 2009 onwards, I stopped referring to the organization I work for as MSF, as an NGO, because I realized it's a bit strange to identify yourself by what you're not. Uh, so I prefer a humanitarian organization or a medical organization. Uh, the other one that I realized is that uh, there's actually a certain logic in this, uh, in, in this remark. That, uh, one problem with the IHL is, of course, that it's an agreement uh, made by states, uh, agreed between states, and signed by states. Non-state armed groups haven't negotiated the IHL, non-state armed groups haven't signed the IHL. So normally they would be perfectly entitled to say it has nothing to do with us. But since we are both NGOs, it's actually in their interest to abide by IHL because uh, it's about the only thing they've got. All the other international legal frameworks uh, essentially don't apply to them, but because they have an official position in the IHL, they uh, can uh, claim a certain uh, uh, legitimacy by saying we are a party to the conflict, so therefore the uh, delivery of humanitarian aid is something that we, uh, as a non-state armed group, uh, to our populations is something we are entitled to. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, humanitarian organizations and non-state armed groups in this logic are natural bedfellows. Uh, very often the only international uh, uh, representation that has direct face-to-face uh, -face contacts uh, with non-state armed groups are the humanitarian uh, agencies. Um, so what went wrong? Uh, it's, it's, it's always quite easy on this topic to, uh, to talk about what I call the non-negotiables. We all know uh, where, uh, the examples where engagement between humanitarians and non-state armed groups uh, uh, has not been possible or failed. Uh, the, the, uh, the groups like Islamic State or the Boko Haram or the Lord's Resistance Army and to a certain extent uh, Al-Shabaab in uh, Somalia, although there have been periods that uh, agreements existed between the humanitarians and the, the, the Al-Shabaab. Uh, this is not the, the exclusive domain of, uh, of, of non-state armed groups to be uh, non-negotiables. Uh, there is quite a number of states that, actually, states that fall into that category as well. Uh, uh, humanitarians fail to have a meaningful uh, uh, agreements with states like North Korea, Eritrea, uh, partially with states like Sudan uh, or Syria, we could uh, certainly argue. Uh, so that in itself is, is, is not the issue here. Here there is very little difference uh, between non-state armed groups and states in the terms of the ability of humanitarians to come to uh, a humanitarian compromise. This actually brought me back to uh, actually a much more out of the mainstream example that uh, I remembered. Uh, in 2006 I was involved in negotiations uh, on behalf of MSF between the Maoist rebels in Nepal. Uh, 
uh, and ourselves uh, to get access to the territories they, uh, they control. Many in this room would probably have not even realized that in 2005, 2006, there was a civil war in, uh, uh, in Nepal. Uh, when we finally got to meet uh, the guys uh, face to face, uh, very cloak and dagger, uh, blinded cars, blindfolds, uh, changing cars three times, uh, uh, to actually meet them. Uh, they said, well, we have an agreement ready here for you. Here's the MOU. And essentially, we want you to uh, deliver three doctors uh, to uh, this checkpoint, and we will give those doctors back to you after, three, uh, after two years. <laughs> that, that was their, the deal that they, uh, that they proposed. Uh, obviously, we didn't, well, not obviously. There might be some volunteers here in the room that kind of liked that arrangement. but. <clears throat> In this case, we decided to decline that offer, but again, it, it, it made me think, like, well, what is going on here? Why is there such an extreme position uh, from an armed group that is uh, totally outside of the legal framework, uh, and uh, we have services to offer, so offer that they definitely uh, need? You have to realize, in the civil war, uh, the Nepalese government and the Nepalese uh, still then uh, king uh, jumped a bit on this uh, war on terror bandwagon uh, that... Uh, uh, envelope the globe after 2001, uh, and they declared uh, and adopted an anti-terrorism law where they declared any kind of contact uh, with the Maoist rebels as uh, uh, totally illegal, including for the humanitarians. Uh, as a result, one, it was very difficult to meet them, hence the cloak and dagger blindfold stuff. Uh, two, it uh, also meant, uh, it, I realized, it disincentivized uh, these rebels uh, to actually abide by IHL and, and come to a reasonable arrangement uh, with the, the humanitarians. Because if the other side of the conflict, uh, the state uh, decides by law, by uh, very severe anti-terrorism laws, to place this group outside of IHL, then they have no interest anymore themselves to abide by IHL. It's a, it's a give and take uh, situation. The other thing that it taught me was, uh, because in Nepal, fast forward a few years, the, the king uh, fled the country, the uh, peace agreement was reached, and those terrorist uh, commanders of the Maoists are now part of the government. So uh, another <clears throat> truism, if you like, from this episode is that uh, every terrorist uh, is somebody else's freedom fighter, in a sense. So that is something to, uh, to, to realize. Now, this is not... Uh, if we go back to Afghanistan, which is an example of uh, where uh, humanitarian assistance was in a, in a situation uh, where there was an extreme co-optation of humanitarian assistance by both sides for their military and political agendas. Afghanistan, Iraq, we know the, uh, uh, the example. So, it's, uh, so what happened there was that uh, it wasn't just the, the states that got themselves into uh, difficulties uh, with their own anti-terrorism uh, narrative. And don't forget, the war on terror Terror is not a person or a country. So to, uh, you essentially attack an idea. If you attack an idea, that means uh, the main uh, audience for the war on terror is the general public. That has to be uh, convinced that uh, terrorism is bad and uh, is outside of the mainstream. The, the same was uh, on the other side. Uh, one of the oddities of negotiating this uh, humanitarian space in Afghanistan is that both sides, the United States on one side, and we negotiate away with the special forces in uh, Tampa, Florida, and then on the other side with uh, what is, was called the Quetta Shura, uh, negotiating with them in a location which is not Quetta uh, about these things. They both agreed that it's very important that we reach an agreement. They both agreed that it's very important that we speak to both sides. But after reaching the agreement, they said, oh, by the way, uh, the U United States says, uh, we uh, must never see you actually talking to a Taliban in Afghanistan uh, because you would be breaking the anti-terrorism law and we would have to arrest you. And arrest means Guantanamo Bay, waterboarding, all of that. Uh, on the other side, the Taliban said, great, we've reached an agreement, and of course you talk to the Americans. Oh, by the way, uh, it's important that we never see somebody from your staff enter into a US army base, because if you do, then we have to assume you're a spy and we have to kill you. Th these are actual words that uh, th these people spoke to me. 
And then you realize that both sides got themselves entangled in their own uh, uh, very polarized narrative. Uh, on the one side, the war on terror, every terrorist uh, is bad and is not a human being and not deserving of uh, aid. On the other side, every foreigner is an, uh, uh, an invader and uh, needs to be driven from, uh, for, from the land. So even when it's in both interests to uh, actually come to a deal, which they did in 2009, uh, you are still in a situation that their own narrative uh, actually hampered uh, a practical impl uh, implementation of, uh, of, of, of this. But this is not uh, the prerogative of only of these obvious uh, conflicts where uh, humanitarian assistance got completely subsumed into the military agendas like uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and of course uh, now you see the same in, uh, in, in Syria and in uh, uh, other places uh, uh, in, that, uh, in that region. Uh, the whole humanitarian machine, in a sense, uh, got a bit geared to that. Uh, I, got, I was a bit amused when I read uh, some of the, the documents that were sent around that uh, uh, somebody argued uh, that, uh, of course, in places where there is a United Nations peacekeeping mission, uh, it's much easier to, uh, to, to be n neutral. Now, that is not an experience that, uh, that I would have because uh, since 2008, uh, all United Nations missions are integrated missions, which means uh, the stabilization of the state, the reconstruction of the state, and the legitimacy of the state, which are all objectives of these missions, uh, go hand in hand with the humanitarian assistance and the peacekeeping missions. So uh, the survival of the state uh, as a whole has become the priority of uh, the, the United Nations uh, uh, machine. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing uh, is, is not up to me to say, but the result is that the humanitarian action becomes a function of, uh, of, of, of state building and so does the, 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 the peacekeeping. Now I have a particular thing against peacekeeping because I started my humanitarian career, if you like, in Liberia in 1992 where uh, the peacekeepers there were Nigerian troops uh, under uh, a mandate of uh, ECOWAS, and they managed to actually uh, kidnap me for ransom, the peacekeepers. <clears throat> I was worth uh, $50,000, apparently. Um, but uh, let's, let's go a bit to the current situation and uh, spread out a bit this logic of uh, how uh, uh, a narrative uh, of anti-terrorism combined with a disregard of uh, IHL by states uh, uh, further and further disincentivizes uh, non-state armed groups uh, to uh, engage with humanitarians, which logically is, uh, is, is, is in their, uh, their interest. I just recently came back, I was in July uh, a bit in, uh, in Kasai in the Democratic Republic of, uh, of Congo and a few weeks ago in uh, in Bangui in, uh, in, in Central Africa. Uh, why do I use these two examples? Because these are what is often called in humanitarian circles uh, the, the, the classic humanitarian uh, context, where for decades there has been uh, humanitarian action and non-state armed groups and states are kind of used to the humanitarian consensus where the humanitarians talk to everybody and this is broadly respected. What scared me about uh, these two situations now um, where in both cases uh, local militia, self-defense groups uh, uh, were creating a wave of uh, violence that uh, the states, the Central African state and the Congolese state were actually starting to use the, the, the terrorist narrative. So again, placing non-state armed groups outside of uh, the, the, the rule of law. Uh, at least in Central Africa, I can't escape to think that uh, the, the, the recent uh, multiple attacks on, uh, on humanitarians, uh, four or five big incidents uh, th this year, is, uh, is related to this narrative. As soon as you place uh, non-state armed groups uh, outside of, uh, of the framework, then the result is that they have no incentive anymore to, uh, to respect in any way uh, the humanitarians or the, the patients. So finally, uh, to come back to... Uh, IHL accountability. Uh, somebody argued in one of the pieces that uh, the f uh, for non-state armed groups there is uh, much less of a functional framework to, uh, to hold them accountable as compared to states. Uh, for an organization that just went through uh, the bombing of uh, a hospital in uh, Kunduz, uh, killing 48 people, an act done by a state, 
clearly in violation of IHL. Uh, the only question is, uh, is uh, was there intent? Uh, the existing uh, mechanism for holding states to account, the International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission, uh, not only was refused to be used in, uh, in, in this case uh, by the United States and by the Afghan uh, state, it turns out it has never been used. So I question a bit that accountability for states is, uh, is, 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 is well developed. Uh, and that brings me to one of the premises uh, of this, uh, this conference is that uh, conflicts are more complex. Again, I go back to Liberia, uh, 1992, uh, 10 uh, different armed groups, uh, multiple states in the region uh, involved in the conflict, uh, peacekeepers behaving badly. I don't really think that the conflicts now are more complex than those conflicts in the 1990s. But uh, what has changed probably is that uh, we were used to uh, a very binary uh, humanitarian world. In the 1980s, there were good guys and bad guys. The good guys was the West, the bad guys was the communists. Uh, humanitarians were by and large financed by the West, so therefore they were uh, helping the rebels uh, in Afghanistan, they were helping the rebels in Cambodia, they were doing nothing on the, on the other side. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so it was all, uh, uh, all very simple, but obviously it was not very IHL uh, at the time. Uh, then we had the 90s and uh, most of the, the, the noughties, I think it's called, 2000-2010, uh, uh, where we kind of got used to a humanitarian consensus where working on both sides uh, was acceptable and by and large uh, respected by states and by non-state armed groups. I have a bit of an impression that uh, because I can't disconnect the bad behavior of the states. Uh, one of the, the themes in the last two years is the bombing of hospitals. Well, uh, uh, rebel groups don't have air forces. So every time you hear about bombing of a hospital, it's a state who is violating IHL. Uh, there's no action without reaction. So we have a multitude of armed groups now also that are also not re respecting the IHL. So I have the impression that the biggest problem we are struggling here with not is the unwillingness of non-state armed groups to work with humanitarians, but that we are moving back a bit to a binary world where there's good guys and there's bad guys, and we will only be able to negotiate with the good guys. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, MSF, for giving me the chance to speak today, but also thanks, MSF, for allowing me the chance to meet an old friend that we haven't met in 20 years or night. <laughs> he came by sea uh, six days in the Mediterranean. Good, and now he ended in Germany. You'll see a lot of Syrians here. Few Germans, by the way. We are planning some integration courses for Germans here in the for <laughs> So thanks MSF, thanks Germany, really. Uh, I'm going to speak a bit about the Syrian experience in this non-state negotiating um, negotiation uh, stuff. As Syrian uh, and as a local NGO, we've developed our own rules in dealing with uh, non-state actors. Although at the end, I would like to speak about negotiations with state actors. I don't know why everyone excluding them from the process. <laughs> they are equally bad. <laughs> so, our experience tells us, rule number one, we are not protected whatsoever. No matter what rules we follow, we are not protected. We will give speeches on the nice things we have. We have principles, bravery, good intentions, but on the other side, they have knives, guns, jet fighters, and more importantly, decisions, and funds. Salute to MSF always for this. Uh, no matter what we do, there is always one behind us pulling our, us from the neck if something goes wrong with the non-state actors. And there is the non-state actor negotiating with us. And of course, around us is the beneficiaries. When I say we are not protected, I mean humanitarians and more importantly, our beneficiaries. No one is protected in this sphere. 
Rule number two, and then uh, before I move to rule number two, I would say that with all the following rules, always we have to revert to rule number one. We are not protected. So what I will say right now as rules that helped us a lot, I would again say, listen, and, everything, and if everything, anything goes wrong, revert to rule number one, you are not protected. Rule number two is neutrality and impartiality. People speak about this in, in our sphere, at least in Syria, as if this is something to behave good. For us, it protected us in several cases, and I will show how. In Syria, there are tens of actors, tens of state actors and tens of non-state actors. Almost counted 83 nationalities are there in Syria. And we are all here in Germany. <laughs> we left the country for them. So we were bombed like hell, everybody knows, by jet fighters. Our hospitals were destroyed. Uh, our uh, colleagues were killed. I myself lost just uh, a year ago five dear colleagues to me who were bombed in an ambulance. But we did not, and we were not able to, condemn who bombed us. We did not mention even who bombed us. Everybody knows who this, who's in the sky, huh? But we didn't say it. Because if we condemn them, then we have to condemn everyone that violates uh, humanitarian principles on the ground. And if we don't do that, then the other party would immediately say, listen, you are partial. This meant that we had to be attacked by everyone and smile all the time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attacking us. It was nice. Let's move to the next state. Rule three. In all our negotiations we had, the most important thing we found is that we need to mobilize the community. We need the community. And our main interlocutor was the community itself. We built our networks. For example, in negotiating with ISIS in Ratta, we had our primary health care centers there. And we wanted to provide maternity, primary health care in, in that area. So we had to go to some uh, intermediaries from the same area after massive stakeholder analysis to see who can we talk to without having some consequences. And that was really influential in terms of negotiating with ISIS through these intermediaries, something called like the Medita Medical Commission in Raqqa, a civilian, uh, let's say, uh, NGO. Uh, one of the occasions, for example, with this, they came to us and they said, uh, listen, and this again brings us back to rule number one, uh, ISIS <laughs> said, uh, okay, fine, we will allow you in to operate, however, only under one small condition, that you don't give salaries directly to the doctors, you give us the money, and we give the doctors, uh, we, we will take care of the doctors, uh, really. <laughs> We give you the money and you will take after, look after our, uh, our doctors there. And who will look after my family when I'm wearing an orange suit in Guantanamo? I cannot do that. So, you're laughing, right? <laughs> it took us months. It took us 10 months negotiating with ISIS to, con to convince them just to do it on our own. Of course, we failed. And they kicked us out. They kicked us out and say, accusing us of being spies to the West and that we are arranging the fund from the United States and blah, 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 etc. Rule number four, if you don't have state, reinvent state. This is what we did. In non-ISIS, non-government areas, there was no state. And if you don't have a central authority, then negotiating with whoever you have on the ground is troublesome. So we reinvented state. We kinda created a central authority through an alliance with local councils, something called health directorates, civil society. We sat together and we said, listen guys, 
we need a state. There is no state here. And then we had, finally, an institution called Health Directorate, suspected by everyone, and throughout the last one and a half years, this state, non-state organization, quasi-governmental organization, let's say, has helped us a lot because it was a central authority. No one can find against, fight against it because it had all the medical facilities under it. This means if you fight against them, you lose everyone, and then you lose every place you can treat even your soldiers in. So in reinventing state in a place where non-state actors exist really helped us a lot. And rule number five, negotiating with state actors is not easier than negotiating with non-state actors. In Syria, there are multiple states present. Uh, let's say like this, uh, the coalition, Syrian government, the Iranian government, the Russian government, the Turkish government, you count. Uh, why are we so attracted to talk about non-state actors? Because they don't have phone numbers? Uh, because we assume they are more dangerous? Well, please look at doctors in danger outside where we put there to show you that we suffered a lot from state actors last month only, and I'm going to talk about this again tomorrow, last month only, five fortified hospitals, supposedly fortified, were leveled to the ground. So why are you assuming that dealing with state actors is easier? Simply because they are states and they have some presence in the United Nations and some, they have legitimacy, but not really always having principles, by the way. Example to that. You remember Aleppo two years ago? The evacuation of Aleppo? We were awesome, our organization with Sam's, our sister organization, along with WHO, with UN OCHA, at the center of the negotiations. They created a room for us where we sit together and negotiate with the hospitals inside because we wanted first to evacuate the injured, injured people. We had to negotiate through the UN with all state actors, and we could not stop them from evacuating 40,000 people to our side, to the, the side where we operate, and 160,000 to the other side, and we were not able to, by few hours from them, to convince hospitals, let's start the evacuation. Please, just give us six hours. People are afraid. They cannot evacuate injured now because they feel that they will be abandoned. And if we evacuate injured people, they will bomb them. Please give us six hours only. We were not able to do so. In many other cases, with non-state actors, we could negotiate. But non-state actors are much weaker than countries. Our experience in Syria may be a bit difficult, too much difficult, in fact. But it tells you lots of lessons that let's not go and generalize right from, right from the beginning. Now, when I say non-state actor, immediate thing comes to your mind is ISIS and Qaeda. In Syria, we have tons of, tens of other non-state actors too. It's not only the bearded maniacs. It's not the bearded crazy ISIS or Qaeda only. And you have gangs. Many of our staff were kidnapped by gangs for uh, the, uh, what do you call the consignment or the uh, vehicle that has some medicine. Let's not generalize. Let's not follow media almost. Non-state actors does not mean only jihadis. Maybe jihadis are the worst, frankly speaking, but they are not the only ones. And non-state actors is, are not easier than state actors. Thank you. Well, there's a lot there to get through. Um, I think we all know what the first rule of Fight Club now is. <laughs> we are not protected. Um, I'm going to start with a question. We don't have any representation here from governments. 
So I'd like the panelists to tell me if they were a state having to balance the many priorities states have to balance, such as security threats uh, and the environment we're living in today, what would you do differently to improve the situation for humanitarians and non-state actors? give more money to the ACRC to start with. <laughs> but no, we have, uh, we have noticed uh, in our interaction in this very, very, very complicated environment, uh, some, we, we've interacted with some really tough states that could not see um, the added value of having neutral um, intermediary role accepted for, for, for especially the ICRC. Sometimes uh, there are some, 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 some changes that happen. Uh, it could be an administration change. It could be also a different conception on the way they perceive the end game in the conflicts. When they start seeing that maybe we should engage with these guys, then we see a cascade change. Uh, uh, then it's not so much taboo that actually the ICRC is talking to these guys. It's a good thing. Uh, another deal make another uh, deal breaker sometime is a, a hostage release. Uh, uh, I can tell you sometimes this can have uh, a tremendous uh, effects on both uh, politicians and the populace regarding uh, the importance of, of us engaging with uh, with non-state armed groups. Uh, this 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 is the case in, in in many places in in Afghanistan, but it was the case in, in the recent Shibok girls. Ironically, we often find our allies in government in very unusual places. Uh, uh, those who understand the pertinence of what we do are often found in the military. Military tend to be less scandalized that we're talking with the other side. They tend to be less scandalized that we are giving first aid, we're teaching first aid to Taliban. Um, because they understand also that um, because the ICRC came in with family news of their soldiers, maybe next day they will come back with a, with a live soldier. So, so governments uh, go through different steps as we do. Um, but when it comes to, to respect of IHL, um, much, much more need to be done. Uh, not much more need to be done. In, 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 in almost all conflicts where we're working. All right, but when it comes to, to states, I think uh, what we really don't emphasize enough is the, the power of self-interest. In, uh, in my experience, uh, most states, uh, most leaders of countries and their, their governments, uh, they really have a limited set of uh, priorities, number one being uh, holding on to power and the economic benefit that comes uh, with that for themselves and for their uh, political or other uh, groupings that they belong to. Uh, and, and, and secondly uh, comes, uh, of course, uh, not uh, losing the, 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 the wider support of uh, uh, of the population, and that's valid in both democracies and, uh, and, and, and uh, non-democracies. Uh, to, to appeal to a humanitarian impulse uh, in, uh, with such uh, powerful uh, uh, competition for uh, the uh, priorities uh, within a, a, a state and government sphere is, is I think, useless. Uh, so uh, we really have to make the argument how uh, allowing humanitarian assistance and maintaining international law is in their long-term self-interest. Let's face it, uh, the IHL, as was drafted in 1948, if you put that, if that didn't exist and you would put it in front of all the countries in the world now, there would be no state that would sign it. Uh, because uh, you actually give away uh, a bit of your sovereignty by signing the IHL. And if there's one thing that states abhor is to make any concessions on, uh, on sovereignty. Ask uh, Madrid uh, uh, how that feels. So, uh, uh, but also, I can't remember any conflict, with the exception maybe uh, of uh, Sri Lanka, where uh, the conflict has ended in a, with a military solution, 
almost all conflicts that, uh, that ended, in the end, ended because a dialogue and a uh, political arrangement uh, was reached. Now, within that longer-term vision, it's in their self-interest uh, of governments to actually maintain humanitarian assistance and maintain IHL. So really, I think, uh, because, uh, for, uh, frankly, for humanitarians, uh, the IHL is the only thing we've got. Uh, nobody has unsigned it yet, uh, and the two words uh, as, uh, such as uh, uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross uh, uh, is the only thing that gives legitimacy to, uh, to humanitarian assistance. So if we don't uh, forcefully start to point out the self-interests uh, that states have in maintaining their power and uh, uh, leg legitimacy, uh, then we're going to lose that argument. Yeah, um, we have really only uh, the IHL. Uh, everyone signed it, uh, very few respect it, uh, in terms of states, of course. Uh, but just to give my answer to this question, I think the answer is uh, a very practical one that will never be implemented, which is if states, if governments want really to serve a humanity, they should take some risk. Is there any country who wants to take the risk in terms of funds diversion, for example, for the sake of humanity? They will tell you no, and I give examples. Polio, we saw a breakout of polio in Syria in 2014, 15, and this year too. Simply because we will not be able to have a routine vaccination in ISIS controlled areas. So when we raise this issue with donors, there was fund for polio, because polio is not dangerous for Syrians only. Polio can have just an impact all over the world. So they said, you have 30% diversion of funds, 30%. When it comes to maternity, 80% of the births in Syria happen at home by, by friends, not by midwives, not by gynecologists. We are allowed of zero diversion. So we have to deal with every single stuff we deal, that there is no single diversion, because our backs, our back is not covered. No one, no one will support us if something goes wrong. Whereas vaccination, for example, we could have, find something. So governments can take risk if they really want to serve humanity. In, in ISIS-controlled areas in 2015, for example, there were 4 million people and maybe 20,000 jihadis. So the 4 million people were punished. We were not able to operate there, not because of ISIS only, but because of the international politics. Thank you. Right, I'm going to open it up to questions now. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to kick us off? Wave at me, this gentleman up here, yeah. Hello, uh, thank you very much. My name is Khal Kiali. I would like to ask, uh, according to this topic, uh, like we know in Syria there is a lot of areas, you said that uh, some areas are controlled by diff uh, different actors. But now, uh, for example, in the north, when Al-Qaeda controlled uh, the whole state, the whole Idlib, and uh, for example, the Free Army controlling most of Dara, so do you consider it easier to, go ne to negotiate with one actor instead of many actors? This is the first question. The second question is, uh, so we know that uh, Al-Assad regime is sieging. There is some places in Syria under siege since four years, like Al-Ghuta. And Al-Assad in this case said, like what your example, ISIS said, uh, you give us the money and we will take care of the doctors. And in uh, the regime uh, side, Al-Assad said, or the government, the regime said, uh, you give us the aid and we will deliver it. And after the, I mean, they, negotiate and they found this solution and after that this aid were 
deliver to the areas that under al Assad control, not the beneficiaries that they wanted to deliver it to. So do you consider it also as a success? Should we accept to give the aid to the to al Assad regime to deliver it? Because we don't have access, real access to these beneficiaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there a couple more questions? Yeah, the gentleman there and the lady there. Uh, I'm Jean-François Véran from uh, University of Rio. And um, uh, we, I think there is a consensus that there is a, uh, a balance to be found between the uh, principle of reality and the reality of principles. It stays somewhere in between. What my concern is uh, about settings where the question is why negotiating in the first place because you don't gain anything from negotiating. And I'm mainly referring to uh, settings in Central America where uh, we try to negotiate, but the actors, the leaders die in a few months, so it takes you weeks to make contact, and then he's killed. Life expectancy for him is about two years, and then you have to, to do it all over again. And because even though you, you have a deal, the deal won't be respected. It's, be, it's, going to, it's very unpredictable. You know the French guy that made the documentary in El Salvador, La Vida Loca? He was killed by the gang he was filming, even though he had an agreement of filming with them. So uh, our, our concern is in those settings of extreme unpredictability and extreme violence. Uh, I visited a, an MSF project when uh, it was about a medical assistance to the migrants in, along the train line in Mexico. And uh, within the MSF facility, there will be spies they will uh, uh, study who they will kidnap, and they will kidnap them 100 meters away when the trend will stop. And we knew it, and we couldn't do anything about it. Uh, the one time we tried to voice and to uh, denounce it, we had, two, uh, we had 10 dog heads in the front line of our, of our facility. So my, my question is uh, basically, uh, what, what, how can we engage context where uh, the levels of violence of, and unpredictability makes it basically uh, with no purpose to negotiate at all. And this lady in the front here. Um, I'm Corinna Kreidler, I'm an independent consultant. My question is, is negotiating with non-armed state actors a male business? And what would change if women got more involved? Yes, we were talking about our manal earlier on. Um, right, Mamadou, do you want to start us off trying to answer a few of those? Yeah, I like the question. We, we were discussing this at lunchtime, and, um, and I was telling her that I don't participate in all-male panel because we thought that, uh, it, but, um, well, I'm the <laughs> mea culpa. Uh, in my experience, I've, 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 I've had colleagues uh, of all walks of life, of all gender. Um, I mean, th the first colleague we had recently in the Lake Chad region, who foot, puts foot on the, on the inside the lake, uh, was, a, was a Canadian girl, you know. So, um, so, so there is no, um, there is no, no boundaries there. Of course, uh, you have to, you, you cannot generalize, you have to take it on a case-to-case -case basis, uh, because sometimes you also have to keep in mind that you don't want, um, the opportunistic exposure of some, 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 some aid workers, because the threats are, uh, are numerous. So taking into this into consideration, sometimes there's some nationalities that you just don't want to send in some, some places, uh, for example. Um, but, uh, but, but for me, uh, this gender issue uh, uh, is no, no issue. Uh, now coming to this gentleman's question, why negotiate? Uh, why engaged? Um, for us, this is not even a question in the ICRC. Um, as long as these groups have the ability to, to harm, 
uh, we have to engage. Now, of course, uh, engaging these groups come with its toes of frustration, as you pointed out. Um, in Afghanistan, we had the same situation. In North Mali, we had the same situation. You, you develop trust relationship with folks that you know, and you can issue, uh, you can share your movements on a weekly basis, and the information can go down the chain, and uh, in action is taking place. It's quite smooth. Um, they're killed. You start over again. Uh, there's just no other way around it. You start over again. Uh, unfortunately, in some contexts, the older guys get killed, new ones come in, foreign fighters come in, uh, others come in with no ties to the soil, uh, who, 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 who care a little bit less about the, the need of the communities, uh, and this it becomes more complicated, but you, you still have to, to go back the next day and the next day. Um, now, the, it's not a coincidence that we cannot testify. Um, we, we are exempted. I know this is controversial for some. We are, we are, we are exempted from testifying before the International Criminal Court. Uh, um, and I think this has its worth. Uh, it has its worth. Because, um, because I can tell you that there are front lines that we cross uh, uh, where um, if, if, if this was not the case, um, yeah, it would be complicated to come back after, after you cross that line. But, uh, but always keep, keep, keep the eyes on the price and, and that's, uh, that's really the, the, the beneficiaries that we represent. What I tell the young delegates, the young colleagues working with the ICRC, I, I, it's, it is that consider yourself as a diplomat, you know. Um, not representing your countries, but representing the interests of those affected by armed conflicts. What does this mean? This means that you're going to have to cross lines, you're going to have to shake people's hand, and hands that have, uh, that have done some, some terrible things, but you have to do it. Uh, you have to do it, you have to be frustrated, you have, and then you come back the next day and, 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 and go back again, um, always keeping the need of, of, of those who suffer from, from these terrible armed conflicts. All right, on the, the gender issue, um, what is certain is that uh, being a non-state armed group leader, a warlord if you uh, like, is uh, predominantly of not exclusively a male business. I have very rarely encountered uh, armed groups uh, led by, uh, by, by women, rarely, not uh, exclusively not. Uh, for a long time, uh, there was assumed that because you're negotiating with men, uh, shouldn't it be men negotiating? I actually took the opposite uh, tack on, uh, on that one already since 10, 15 years. Uh, and again, being purely pragmatic, uh, I find it actually much more useful to uh, have a lot of experienced female staff in negotiating because you actually avoid one obvious hurdle when you enter in negotiations. Uh, warlords uh, tend to be... Uh, I think what psychologists call uh, the, the more alpha male types. So if you put another alpha male in front of that uh, to negotiate, it very often becomes a measuring contest uh, rather than uh, uh, actually negotiating about uh, content. If you have a female negotiator, you take that hurdle away. Uh, you immediately uh, put somebody in front that at least from that uh, uh, alpha male perspective is a non-threatening uh, individual. So I, I find it actually useful to uh, have a, a large group of very experienced female negotiators in the, the teams that we use in, in MSF for that, uh, for that reason. Uh, so do we discriminate on gender? Very much so, but uh, actually uh, by uh, deliberately uh, finding more female negotiators rather than male negotiators. Uh, is, it, uh, is it worth it? Uh, yes, uh, rebel leaders get uh, killed, they don't keep their word, uh, and all of that. But that is actually the same uh, on, on the state side. Uh, uh, it, actually, in that logic, uh, the, the worst state to negotiate with is actual democratic states. Because every four years they have these pesky elections, <laughs> and then you have to deal with another government and another... Uh, so, uh, th that is not the exclusive domain of, 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 of non-state uh, actors, uh, but it makes it, uh, makes it very, very, very difficult. But uh, uh, you have to. Uh, one, because both those states and non-state armed groups, they control both uh, the territory and the populations that you claim you want to, uh, to, to serve. 
So if you don't negotiate, you simply don't get in. That's on the pragmatic side. But even if you do get in, if you don't have an uh, explicit buy-in, uh, it's obviously uh, more dangerous, although I agree uh, that uh, with your no, rule number one, that in general you're not prote protected. If the civilians are not protected, then you are not protected, because you are just a civilian as a humanitarian. Uh, but it's also actually dangerous for the people receiving the, the, the aid. Uh, if you are seen to be exclusively working for a government or exclusively working for a non-state armed group, then receiving that assistance uh, actually becomes a political act. And people get targeted for actually accepting food uh, from you as soldiers uh, because they say, what did you have to give in exchange for that, uh, for that food? Uh, did you have to give in, uh, in information? So even if you don't do it for your own protection, uh, you are obliged to do it, to try to get as much consensus of all the power brokers, uh, if for nothing else, for the protection of the beneficiary of that assistance. And then I'll leave, obviously, the Syria questions to you. Um, on the mail business, no, it's not. It's perception only. Uh, do you imagine a female going to negotiate with Al-Qaeda or ISIS? Yeah, I do. Yes? Yes, it happened a lot. Actually, one of uh, a very good friend of us, we rely a lot on her, and any incident happens in certain area in Syria because she is the one who can talk to them. Uh, of course, uh, she has the Islamic look, uh, but she understands politics. She's an amazing negotiator. And in fact, if I, I travel a lot to the north of the uh, northern side of the country, I always phone her, uh, listen, uh, Raifa, her name, uh, I'm going inside. Don't worry, go inside and I'll, I'll see how to do, what to do. Uh, again, and it's about perception because when we say uh, the, these are jihadis, Islamic or Islamist, groups, then we don't imagine a female negotiating with them because we, oh, they will rape her. Uh, they do rape, of course, and they are crazy, may a maniac, but you can find always ways, and in many cases we found that some females are really good in doing that, uh, much better than men, by the way. Uh, and with other non-state actor, not to mention here, we always uh, deal with a female from that side who always <laughs> You laugh now, because <laughs> you knew. Uh, so it's not a male business, it's just a perception. Uh, with regards to one versus many, Idlib, of course one is much better than many. But not if that one is Al-Qaeda. Uh, but just three months ago, before Qaeda took over in Idlib, we had two main big factions. If we, if, some, if a wounded person comes to one of our, our hospitals and this person happens to be of that side, then the other side always accuses you, oh, you are with that side. And as you just said, whenever you do something, then people would think that you are political. You're siding with this one or that one. So striking balance is always difficult when you have many uh, factions. You don't strike balance. You, you try to do your, do your duty, but people will always accuse you of something. Uh, whereas... When Al-Qaeda took over, they started now to deal with us in a much, much stronger position. So there is another negative uh, side of it. They came to us to say, listen, we want this training uh, facility. We want to have a conference. It's a long story, but the last, the last phase of the negotiation that happened just uh, four or five weeks ago, uh, our staff had to negotiate with them for three and a half hours and ultimately I told them, I was on WhatsApp with them, and ultimately I told them, listen, if they uh, insist on taking the place, just leave it. Just leave the place and we will write. Of course, we had to write to all our donors. I don't know, luckily, after three and a half hours, the guy was really brave and smart to uh, send them away. But when they were alone, it became really difficult. So this has negative stuff, and the other one has negative uh, stuff too. 
With regards to besieged areas and whether we give stuff to the Syrian government to take it inside besieged areas, now, at the first place, they are besieging these areas, so why to give them stuff to bring it into the besieged areas? It's anti-logic, right? I mean, why to give something for someone you are besieging? But in terms of rule number one, if you want to be protected, then of course, give stuff to the Syrian government. No one would tell you why. But dare to give something to ISIS because they will do it. Then, then you have to wear a, an orange suit. Uh, if, you, if this is the question. Now, would, would we give them? We don't trust they will give it inside Ghouta. Of course not. They're besieging it. And the UN, since two and a half years, managed to send inside there around 10 or 12 convoys after negotiating with a state actor for like two and a half years. Very grim. Thank you. I've got a question I'm going to ask, and then I'll go for one more, more round. You mentioned the orange suit. I think that's the third reference to Guantanamo. How much of a chilling effect do counterterrorism laws have on the work that you do? So that's my question. Are there any more questions? We've got time for one more round of questions. Yeah, there's two gentlemen over there, and, and a lady over there, and that will be the final one. Wilfred is my name. Uh, in the context of humanity as a principle, uh, I would like to uh, know from the panelists um, when faced with uh, tough situations in the battlefield and uh, you want to gain access to uh, the victims of, uh, of, of, of the war, let me say, then your, your staff are killed, but you want to gain access to the victims. Do you continue negotiating, or you value your lives more than the principles that you work for? Thank you so much. Um, there is one question I would like to ask um, to you, Mr. Hoffman of MSF. How did you manage to get into the detention camps in Libya? Because obviously we have an irrational state or non-state is not a difference in Libya, I think, actor over there. And I would like how, if you know, how did you proceed to get in there in order to help the, uh, the migrants in the detention camps? Thank you. And the lady over here. Hello, my name is Sigrid Külke um, from Caritas, Interna and, and Caritas Inter International. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I have a question actually um, to all of you. In the beginning, uh, Mr. So from ICRC mentioned um, pragmatism. And actually, I was a little bit shocked because I think we are going too far in the past years about pragmatism. And I feel we are always almost selling now the humanitarian principles just to get in and do distributions because distributions is some, for example, food distributions is always a good promotion for our organizations. We can talk about tonnage and, and it's, it's kind of publicity. So just to give a concrete example, um, Northern Mali, which I think you have mentioned as well, um, it's a context of very a lot of multiple um, actors, armed groups, and they're really controlling tiny areas, the commune, and it's really difficult to know who you're working with. And so actually there has been a lot too many compromises, I think. This pragmatism has been going very far because now you have see, you are, you're seeing actually um, that distributions are done actually through village leaders and this actually, in terms of humanitarian principles, do we still respect the impartiality? Because as you know, a village leader, da da, um, how he will distribute the food. Then um, 
actually the, the attacks are even raising. There's more and more attacks. And you even feel that actually all this insecurity contributes um, to there's the mafiosi network. Even you sometimes think because of this big, a lot of distributions, food going in, um, medication, that actually the attacks are going worse because if there's more attacks, then the, the, the that organi organizations have to work in a remote uh, modus. So humanitarian space actually is zero, and it it enter entertains more and more this mafiosi network where even local staff of humanitarian organizations get involved and they can of complicit with the, the armed groups. So I really think, and what you're always missing, and not only with non-state actors, is actually that nobody knows about humanitarian principles very well. Even the state actors, they actually, they, they don't care. So you can't really negotiate well if people, uh, yeah, I don't know, right from the beginning, I think it uh, would be good to, to add maybe an, uh, an additional rule to the rules that you were saying, that train everybody on humanitarian principles because maybe that will be a, a way to protect ourselves a little bit more and that your first rule one saying you are not protected maybe we can create at least this small protection around okay. our beneficiaries and ourselves thank you okay if you can answer the question and give any closing remarks that would be great do you want to start my yeah uh, listen i thank this lady for 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 this very important question um what I tried to get across was the, the firmness it's on the principles. Here you don't want to compromise. You don't want to ever compromise on your principles. Um, but when you are running a humanitarian mission in very complicated places where, where people um, in dire need of the assistance that you have to provide, you've got to be pragmatic. You, 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 the, 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 how can I say this? I will shock you again, but the principles are not an end to themselves. You see? Um, I know North Mali very well. I was the head of mission in Tombuktu for, for a year. Uh, and I have I've been almost in every village of north of Tombuktu. Uh, the particularity of our work, the reason why we don't ever have armed escorts, we don't have armored vehicles, we don't uh, have um, uh, any military escorts or security or whatsoever, is precisely because of these principles. And we have to engage and engage until we have this acceptance. And when we have it, uh, we enter and we deliver the aid ourselves in 99% of the time of the places where we work. We do the assessment or with the National Society, which is the Red Cross or Red Crescent in the ground. And with them, we go ahead and, and, and cross those lines and distribute the food ourselves. Uh, it's not a matter of trust. It's not that we don't trust uh, community leaders or local chiefs, but we understand that they also uh, can be subject to pressure that are not necessary. So, um, so we engage them, but when it comes to delivering the aid, we, we, we do it ourselves. Um, so, well, thank you. All right, um, to start with uh, the first question, uh, do you still um, continue when you get killed? Well, the simple answer is in most cases, no. Uh, because uh, in the end, you are not a martyr, although, I always find it amusing to see that in Afghanistan, the, the ministry that uh, gives you your work permit is actually the Ministry of Martyrs. Uh, but generally speaking, we are not, uh, uh, not, not martyrs. And there's ample examples, of course, after serious killings or kidnap, uh, for that matter, that, uh, that programs have closed down. Uh, that was the reason that MSF uh, was completely out of Afghanistan uh, between 2004 and 2009, that MSF is just now getting back to, uh, to Somalia. And even in the, the Syrian case, uh, where we actually had an agreement, a negotiated uh, uh, agreement with uh, Islamic State until they violated that agreement and uh, kidnapped five of, uh, of our colleagues uh, 
in uh, 2014. So, uh, and since then, we have not actually resumed any operations in Islamic state-controlled territory. So that there, there is a limit. Uh, we, you, you, you cannot expect uh, that. Uh, uh, delivering aid at all costs uh, means uh, also at the cost of the, the lives of the people that are delivering it. And I think uh, that is uh, for, for everybody. Uh, is there a chilling effect? Uh, this uh, chilling effect is, is well researched and documented in, uh, in the humanitarian spheres, uh, most notably in Somalia. It was uh, very uh, visible once it was, uh, was researched. And, uh, that is mostly not so much because in practice humanitarians are being prosecuted for violating uh, anti-terror laws. Uh, there's been one case of a Palestinian organization, uh, but that's about it. Uh, but that uh, a lot of those uh, states that are actually drafting, uh, making and implementing those anti-terrorist laws are also the major donors of these uh, uh, these interventions. Uh, so they make it uh, either there is no funds available for territories controlled by what they regard as terrorists or they make uh, it uh, exceedingly difficult uh, by having accountability mechanisms that are unworkable, like for instance insisting that there is 0% diversion of uh, your assistance. That doesn't exist. In every war context, a percentage of what you bring in will benefit the armed groups if not directly, indirectly, through taxation of your staff, through a taxation of the businesses that supply to you, that is a fact. Uh, for MSF, because we are not dependent on uh, state aid and we consciously took the decision to uh, take the risk to be prosecuted uh, for anti-terrorism uh, laws, uh, it had not so much of a chilling effect, uh, but that is uh, unfortunately the exception uh, rather than, uh, than the rule. Libya, frankly, I've not been involved in uh, the negotiations around the detention camp, so I cannot answer that question. I presume uh, self-interest, uh, because the situation in those detention camps are very, very bad, and uh, the, uh, one of the three Libyan governments uh, is not prepared to... Uh, uh, to in, in, in invest on, in that, in spite of the fact that the European Union, uh, Union has uh, paid handsome sums to uh, these governments to uh, create those uh, camps in the first place. Now, here is the crux on the pragmatism uh, uh, question. Uh, I could give uh, the same response as my colleague here, that of course it's important and this and that, but that would actually not be the truth. Uh, when uh, I do a lot of the internal trainings in MSF, uh, on the, which is called uh, uh, principles in practice, and essentially what I teach the MSF staff, is that all principles are relative, that all of them are to a certain extent for sale. And uh, some of them very obviously so. Uh, neutrality uh, uh, has always been just a practical tool to make it more likely that armed groups uh, will uh, agree to it. If they don't, then it doesn't apply in any way, it doesn't apply in non-conflict settings. So neutrality, give or take, there's many humanitarian organizations that perfectly legitimately choose not to, uh, to adopt neutrality uh, in, uh, in their self-declared uh, mandates and, uh, and, and, and charters, independence. Well, since uh, most humanitarian organizations are financed by states that uh, themselves are militarily engaged in most of the conflicts that they're working in, uh, is obviously a very flexible uh, uh, principle uh, as, as well. But uh, when it comes to impartiality, uh, the, I would say that that's where you need to be extremely uh, vigilant, uh, not to compromise on it, uh, or not too much, because that is really at the core of humanitarian action. Uh, why? Uh, because uh, that is why you exist. You claim that you have a legitimacy as humanitarian agencies because you're not part of the conflict, you're not part of the state, you're not part of the non-state armed group. So your unique selling point, if you like, is the fact that you are needs-based. If you compromise on that, uh, there's actually no point to your presence there. Then states can, uh, and non-state armed groups can perfectly, and diaspora groups and uh, remittances and all of that can perfectly take care of uh, uh, the humanitarian assistance, uh, but that will not be needs-based. That, that will be based on political expediency, uh, uh, ethnic, uh, linguistic, political links, uh, uh, etc. If you think there's a point to humanitarian assistance, this point is impartiality. And that's why I would uh, not uh, be uh, inclined to, to, to compromise uh, on, on, on that. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Most of the questions were answered. I would just comment on uh, training on humanitarian principles. Um, obviously, it's not easy for us to train any non-state actor as Syrians, because this is again could be this could be considered as dealing with them, which puts us under threat. And when it comes to training even states, as you just mentioned, uh, training, let's say, the government on uh, IHL and humanitarian principles, I'll tell you this small story. I was detained in solitary for two and a half months in 2013 in Syria. Uh, one of the charges against me was, and this is what the judge told me, is it true you are delivering aid to hospitals? I said immediately, no. I swear not. I'm not exaggerating. My wife is here, and she was just next to me the, the day uh, I was released. Uh, so how can you train someone on humanitarian principles if the charges <laughs> is helping others? I'm not exaggerating, literally. So uh, I don't think they don't know states specifically. They all know IHL humanitarian principles. They have apparatus, they have universities, they have, but simply they know also how to violate them. Especially when there is security council, then that does nothing against. In terms of anti-terrorism act, yes, of course, it's a nightmare. Especially for local NGOs. I'll be a bit, Blunt, I mean, I'm, I'm honest. INGOs have resources and have governments behind them. But we local NGOs, what can we do if something goes wrong? If someone accuses us of something? There is no state to protect us. There is no resources to protect us. And we are the weakest in this uh, cycle, so just punish Local. So, of course, we are, we are really worried when it comes to... Uh, so, this is why we deal really with so, so much precaution and this is okay, this is not, because we fear something goes wrong. We don't have anyone to protect us. And again, refer to rule number one. We are not protected. And when I say we, specifically, local NGOs. Thank you very much. Uh, we were nearly on time, close enough. Um, it just remains for me to thank the panel and uh, perhaps you'd join me in thanking them for the very rich discussion.